We're live. Live. Hey guys, want to introduce myself, Casey Caraway, with the Caraway Team Podcast in our branded film and media studio. And I'm sitting with Brian Stevens, our local insurance agency owner, Stephen Bastion and Cartwright, and my best friend. We've gotten really close over the past, I guess, ten years, and uh, I had to bring him in because we got a few things in common. Um, not only our families, you know, we have daughters and our work ethic but i think uh, our love of hunting is is pretty close to, uh, i mean different hunting you're obsessed i'm uh, i get obsessed only during a short amount of time when it's <laughs> leading up but you're a year round obsession and i want to kind of bring that into the table today and talk about that so everybody meet Brian Stevens with Stephen Bastion and Cartwright good morning good morning i'm glad to be here well i uh, called him yesterday and said hey i got a podcast scheduled for 11 can you be here and he's like yeah i got a lot of stuff going on and uh kind of leaving for Oregon in a this weekend uh tomorrow tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow so, uh you'll be chasing chasing blacktail blacktail columbia blacktail deer uh in western Oregon and they're just a super unique animal and I've I've been fascinated with them for years but uh started hunting up there uh diligently in about 2011 for Man. them and I haven't missed a year since so yeah there's um you think you're the only person in West County that's killed a blacktail in Oregon? Uh, my wife. Oh my yeah, wife your wife's got <laughs> two with her bow. Tracy is a she's she's awesome been a killer for a long yeah, time. She's killed two really nice bucks with her bow. So one in Northern California and one in Southern Oregon. So that's it's unbelievable. I know there's you've gone for in Oregon to uh, for elk as well. Roosevelt elk. Roosevelt elk. You've killed there. Awesome animal. Yeah, I killed a public <laughs> land bull up there. It was awesome. Uh, the meat quality, I think, on those is is exceptional, and we in a Rocky Mountain. Well, it's I'm, I'm not going to say it's different. It's just that uh, when we are hunting them is early season before the rut, so I think the meat uh, quality is a little better in on any elk. You that's know, you very catch interesting. Catch them before the rut, so makes sense. So you, just like any other get wild game animal, but a little backstory uh, on Brian, and I think I think we need to throw that in there. Um, I can remember you. And I'm going to just say 10 years plus, because I don't know the exact in, you know, time. But my, my, I think my mother was president of the Chamber of Commerce, mm-hmm. or she wasn't on the board already. And it was a hunting-themed um, chamber <laughs> live auction. And I, as the chamber president, now I've always wanted to do a null, and I still never, I never did it. But, um, but I always remember you showed up, and I just bought my first bow and I think I was already like starting to film. I think you even watched one of my films that I was making for bow hunting and you'd watched it on Facebook or whatever. And you came up to me and, um, it was funny because you were dressed full fledged camo and you had a elk bugle on you and you let one out (laughs) and in the, in the Decatur conference center. And I just will never remember that or never forget that sound. I've only watched it on like Saturday mornings growing up and, you know, maybe on YouTube at that time. And that was a very limited amount of resources on YouTube for that. And that like hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, who is this guy? You know, I was like, what is this? And you weren't even in the same shape you are now then. I don't think you were. I mean, you were, you seem lankier and taller than like, like I am, you know, like now you're incredible Hulk style. But I just remember like, and I've watched you progress from that year. I'd say your past 11 years or so, you've changed something mentally, physically, and just the drive in your hunting. I've watched it, and I've actually been around you and been a part of it. Um, so continuing on that backstory, you saw my film that I made on YouTube, and you're like, man, he's got a little skill sets to make a video. And you called me, and uh, maybe a year later, I don't even know, and you're like, hey, I had a cameraman that backed out do you want to go with me on a hunting trip to the Barnes Keith ranch in South Texas? Well, North or not South Texas, but, um, Hill Cent- country, central, Texas. central Texas. And, um, we sat, I sat there for a second and I had to take some vacation days cause I was in a completely different career. And, and I saw it as an opportunity. You, you, it was a week of hunting vacation that I've probably never taken in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I was always just a weekend hunter or a local guy. And you invited me down there, and you basically changed my entire life that week. Oh wow! And uh, I got a lot of stuff on that if you want to talk about that. But I was you, you and I got real close, and you get real close to somebody when you're sitting side by side with them in a blind for five to six days. That and, is a fact. And we we you taught me. I uh, 
I remember making mistakes. You were patient with me, and I, and I fixed them, you know, and, I, and the, I made a level of um, understanding of what hunting really is for filming for an outdoor show in a matter of, like, 48 hours. I had right. to figure it out. Yeah. So that was an interesting story for, to tell, but I enjoy it, and I, something I needed you to know. But Well, I appreciate yeah. that. That's impactful. I, I, uh, I feel like uh, hunting makes brothers of strangers even. We weren't strangers, but it's – and especially I've done a lot of backcountry hunting. I've mm-hmm. done a lot of uh, Alaska, uh, northern Canada, British Columbia, up in the up in the backcountry. And you, a lot of times you are with strangers going in. And uh, by the time you come out, it might be 10 days, it might be 14 days. But you are eating, sleeping, everything, every, uh, when you get into the backcountry, everything is... Uh, uh, you're kind of getting back to a more primal uh, self, you mm-hmm. know, and you, in those environments, I think you connect with people almost immediately if, if you're like-minded, which guys that Nine get times out of that, 10, you're probably like-minded. You are, you are. And those people inspire me because some of those guys are out there um, three months and more. I'll give you an example. In British Columbia, the guys that I hunted up there for stone sheep with, and mountain goat they they ride in there uh on horses a hundred miles to get to where their camp is and that's to get their horses um in a camp where they can kind of they 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 let them free range at night and a wrangler will go and gather them in the morning but they've got to go and make sure that the trails uh that they want to use to get to glassing points are passable um so they're out there three months before the season even starts and living off the land basically and and uh, they, of course they get supplied you know when needed uh, they communicate with a float plane by uh, sat phone but it's a three and a half hour horseback ride just to get to the pond where the plane drops you. no way and it's a sketchy ride so guys like that um and there there were two of them warren lees and um uh, and a guy named uh dylan that um that were there uh that was a really special hunt anyway um but to get there and to meet those guys and see how gritty they are knowing that the three months before the season starts is the beginning and then the season starts and then they've got hunts about every two weeks now for another three months and by the time they come out of there they went in there in the summer uh or spring really and they come out and it is iced over deep snow uh, that area we were hunting is some of the coldest recorded temperatures on the whole planet. So uh, gritty isn't even a good enough word. Those guys are next level. And I, I'm inspired by people like mm-hmm. that. I'm inspired by people like Cameron Haynes, uh, people that that illustrate, you know, the human potential. It's not a – it's not a, – a lot of people get into comfort zones and whatnot, and that's fine, but um, – I'm inspired by people who show us boundaries. You know, they yeah. show us what is what is actually possible. Example with Cam Haynes, a guy who's, you know, he's a backcountry bow hunter. His passion is bow hunting, and he trains to hunt. That's mm-hmm. his whole motivation. But his training is is relentless and unbelievable. His discipline, really, it's not motivation. You know, motivation is fleeting. Motivation comes and goes, but it's discipline. And he uh, he's run a bunch of ultra marathons in the mountains on trails, but he, he's run two over 200 miles. One was 204 miles with 46,000 feet of elevation gain and loss. And one was 238 miles with about 29,000 feet of elevation gain and loss. That is, you're talking days on end (coughs) with zero sleep essentially, or you might get a little few minutes here and there on the trail, but it's a trail run. And, uh, and you're climbing rocks and it's just it's so far beyond what an average human even a a really fit human could possibly achieve that it just it shows us that last they're outliers you Mm -hmm. know and um and i like knowing i like knowing that those things are possible right it's it's, your body can do it it's possible and um and there's people in those disciplines that that start out and they're not in any better shape than anybody else, but they just, something hits them and right. they, they decide to go for that. So that's been an inspiration you mentioned earlier about, 
you know, I, I started my business in 2005 and I had several years there where I was very stressed out, you know, mm -hmm. it was a lot to get going and to manage and to make sure that, that a service standard was there that I envisioned and building a team that yep. represented the values that I wanted to represent and the honesty and the integrity and all of those things. Um, and I let my fitness during that time kind of, you know, really take a back seat. And with that, I wasn't eating as well. And then, um, it was actually a mule deer hunt in Montana that I went on. That was kind of a last minute opportunity one year. And you took uh, it. I took it and I did it and was successful and it was awesome. But at that time, that was kind of the peak of my, you know, allowing stress and all those things to creep in and, and, and displace my, my commitment to my fitness, which, which I had all of my life prior to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I was re-energized. I was following people like Cam Haynes, and I was um, on that hunt. I'll never forget it. I was climbing the last part of a really steep mountain out of this hole that we had gone down into. And uh, this is with Northern Rockies Outfitters up in northern Montana. And I, I looked at that hill as I was approaching it, and I was I was – hurting already we had been climbing for a while getting out of there and i i remember when i got to the top it was all i could do to get to the top of that mountain and i just remember thinking never again mm -hmm. i'm never going to feel like this right here again i enjoy this the god's creation the hunting the experience i enjoy all of that too much to allow my lack of discipline for my fitness to stand in the way of that and in fact if i if i if I go all in on it, think about how much more you're going to enjoy it. You're going to go further. Yep. You're going to do more. Increase your chances. Yeah. You're not even going to be thinking about the, the lack of physicality. You're going to be, you're going to be completely focused on what you're doing instead of the, the, the fitness part just becomes a given. And so I've lived my life that way since that hunt. And it's changed me a lot. I've, I've, uh, I've trained with certain people that, that really know what they're doing and learned, you know, before I thought I knew how to train. I thought I knew how to eat and I was doing a lot of things wrong. And I think it's important that we all, no matter how much we think we know about something, I think it's really important to, to always, I don't care what level you're at, always open your mind to what people that are very good at, you can tell they're successful in that particular discipline. Mm -hmm. Listen to those people. Those are the people that you can learn from. And, um, so I, I started applying all of those things about nutrition, about working out, about my discipline, my, mm -hmm. uh, trying to, trying to lose the whole, uh, trying to find motivation. You know, a lot of people are constantly looking for motivation, but guess what? That's not always going to be there from day to day. Your motivation is going to be all over the place at what it, what you require to, excel is discipline so you have to be disciplined you have to be goal oriented and you know if you're disciplined towards your yeah. goal you're going to get there it may be it may take a while it may take longer than you think or it may go quicker than you think but if you're disciplined you are going to get there eventually so uh learning from those people was extremely uh impactful for me and now i'm i will turn 50 this year and i'm probably in the best shape of my life oh, right yeah. now. And I, that's been my goal. That's been a long-term goal for me was to be my fittest at 50. That's, that's one thing that I've been working on. And, and, and do, you, uh, do you think that in the mountains, in the backcountry, whenever you're young, you can get through it mentally and, you know, with enough grit, you can probably get through it because your body's young. Mm -hmm. Like I'm 34, just turned 34. I, <clears throat> me running a mile and a half this morning, I'm going to try to run three miles a night. I'm just trying to get ready for my backcountry hunt, but I'm three months behind mm -hmm. preparing for this. I mean, I'm no doubt about it. This has been the craziest uh, real estate market and I'm behind this summer uh, because I didn't dedicate myself to the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm scrambling, trying to get ready for this backpack five days backcountry opportunity that I'm on. And, um, and I'm hoping that my mind and my grit can get me through it because I usually have enough of that. And I'm from the past two elk hunts I've ever been on. Well, I've been on uh, three in Colorado, 
this will be my third in Colorado and then um, two in Oklahoma mountains. But anyways, I knew I wasn't physically shaped, but my mind got me through them. And I'm, my question is, do you think as you get older, you have to basically compensate that with your physical ability? Um, your mind's still going to be strong, but your body also fades as you get older. You feel like that's where you're 50 years old coming up. You had to get to and physically. Absolutely. Because as you get older, you know, um, I think your flexibility diminishes yep. your, you know, you feel stiffer if you're not exercising and stretching. I think stretching is really underrated and, and super important. Um, and I think that a lot of people experience a little bit of that feeling of aging. And I think a lot of that is mental as well. Obviously there's physical parts of aging, but, mm -hmm. but a lot of people allow that, allow that to overtake them mentally, I think. And they just start, you hear people use the phrase a lot like, oh, he looks good for his age. Or, I, you know, for somebody his age, I can't believe he did that. Right. You know, and you, those are, those are cop-outs, okay. in my opinion. Those are things, we, we really shouldn't use those phrases because now we're starting to put constraints. We're starting to box ourselves into this, um, well, you should lower your expectations because of your age. No. Don't do that. Raise your expectations to whatever level you feel like you can achieve. One of the races that I mentioned that Cam ran is called the Moab 240, and it's in Utah in the Moab. 238 miles with 29,000 feet of elevation gain and loss. The year that Cam ran that, there was a woman that ran that race, and I can't think of her name, but she was 55, and she came in fifth place overall in front of a bunch of international elite athletes that was her 100th 100 plus mile race wow in the mountains and she ran it and she there were several people in their 50s that ran and finished that race so um and i and i'm i'm pretty sure there was actually one that was a good bit older than that so mm -hmm. um you know i i see if you look for it it's not as common these days with people's eating habits right but if you look for it you can find uh, people that are up there in age that are doing incredible physical things that look incredible mm -hmm. and therefore they feel incredible you know they're I just that's the people that I want to be inspired by I want right. to be inspired by people and it does it's not just about how you look it's about it's about how you feel. And then therefore, if you're feeling better, you're going to have a more positive mental attitude. You're going to have more positive impacts on other people. You're going to be able to do more with your children, your grandchildren yes. for others in the community. When you want to be able to, um, you know, do impactful things for people, uh, the better you are physically and mentally together, the better you're going to be at anything that you're putting your mind to. And, and obviously there's other, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's spiritual priorities. There's all kinds of priorities. Physical is just one, but you need to, in my mind, it's, it's the whole package and you need to be working on all of those. And again, it takes discipline. So I'm leaving September 3rd and then basically September uh, 5th, I believe I'm going to be heading up the mountain. <clears throat> and so we've done a lot of day hikes in and hunted elk and everything. And this year we're, you know, attempting the you know spike you know we'll have one t um, person tents we'll have you know our, everything we need backcountry i've studied it up and made every list i could probably make and preparing to make it as light as possible because every ounce turns into pounds and every pound turns right. into pain and you know physically trying to be getting away from other public hunters exactly. which is what we're trying to do and so me and my brother-in-law elliot he lives in Boston. We're all meeting up, um, and we're, we're, we're basically him and I are taking off on that Monday, Labor Day, up the mountain after spending some time with our in, uh, my in laws and his parents and our kids or everybody's gonna be in the mountain. So I'm gonna be physically trying to be as, at that point getting there, and so I can just take off. And but my question to you, and you know, one thing I've noticed is the popularity in bow hunting, and and I believe I got two things to say here, and I kind of want to go towards two things. But number one, I think it's a great thing. For popularity of bow hunting and it's a great thing for popularity of hunting in the in the western you know mountains because it does require a level of dedication commitment and physical you know well-being in order to 
have a shot at an elk in or any mule deer or whatever pronghorn or whatever it is in a western state it is not like our local whitetail hunting when i respect our local whitetail hunting and i love it to the to the fullest and but when you decide that you're going to be a, a big game hunter like a elk hunter in the mountains it does do something to your brain and, and you start instantly triggering okay i've got to be prepared i've got to build a little bit more dedication i've got to shoot every night whether it be five arrows or 20 arrows or whatever i've got to be shooting and um and i know that feeling i've had that feeling for about four years now and i love that feeling it's probably one of the most favorite times of the year and what it does for you when you accomplish a goal that you set your mind to um and not everybody's going to succeed in a public land situation it's a temp, less than probably 10 percent success rate with a bow and um but lot, one thing that a lot I, less in some lot areas. less yeah. i mean lots less in some areas so what i'm leading into is i'm you know completely proud of what bow hunting is doing for people but do you also believe that the popularity is 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 making it harder to be successful and then what you know what advice can you give me to try to get away from people other than the only thing i've been able to try to figure out is i hit every trailhead every parking area and i did a two mile radius around every opportunity because i know how hard two miles is in the mountains and I'm trying to go beyond that two miles, whether the first day be four miles in and we just go on just trying to get away from people. Um, and then we're going to be sleeping on our packs. So any advice on that back country, trying to get away from public land areas? Yeah. Kind of to address the first part of your question. I, I really think that opportunity wise, um, it's a lot like life in general. There's, um, you could argue there's a lot more competition for business, right? For, mm-hmm. for doing anything um, and being successful. And I think some people feel like that's really daunting, you know, that, yeah. Hey, uh, how do I differentiate my, how do I, how do I get myself to a, a point of success? And, and that's a good question for life in general. Yeah. And the reality is that I think opportunity actually grows even with more competition because um you're going to find that a lot of people are putting some level of effort in and a lot of times it's it's not that much effort and so as an example in life and in business you maybe it's your service standard really isn't very high or for yourself you know maybe and there's a lot of people like that um so if your personal goal is you know, to be amazing at what you do, which it should be. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Right. You should your goal for yourself in anything that you do should be to be amazing at it. And it doesn't matter how simple of an act it is. You should want to do it amazingly well. So, translating that into hunting the backcountry, uh, yes, there are more hunters, and in some areas they've gone to draw units, and 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 that helps the opportunity rate but obviously it hinders the um you know the how often you can go okay. so on an over-the-counter type unit obviously that's turns into overflow for some people who want to hunt no matter what every year yes so yes you do you have more competition but just like in life what you find is a lot of people are putting half efforts in yes so that means some of them never leave the road You're right some of them leave the road by they, they, they go a quarter or half a mile and they think, boy, we're back here now, you know? <laughs> and as you know, uh, there are people with horses and there are oh, people yeah. with other things that are going 20 miles back in there and they're getting into, sometimes it's not the distance. Sometimes it's how rugged is the terrain. The right? elk are in that rugged. They're, they're wild animals and they're surviving a whole myriad of predators and, um, not just humans. They know, where pockets of safety are and obviously ruggedness or or thickness timber and things like that where they know they can go and kind of protect themselves um but that open area is easier to walk through and easier to see and easier to hunt yeah but they're not in that and people just want to apply tactics that they've seen on tv or something you know especially if they're newer to it uh that that may work in some of those situations or in a draw unit where the animals aren't being pressured as much, you know, those things may work, but you can't go and apply those tactics, uh, in a public land situation. Good example with elk is, you know, uh, a lot of times in an over the counter unit, if you start calling a lot of times you're, you're actually drastically hurting your odds of success because you're, 
you're drawing attention to yourself, not only from other hunters, but you're, you're trying to get the attention of an animal who they've heard 50 other people do that too much and do it poorly. And in the past six days. Yep. And all it's doing is fine tuning their senses as to knowing who they're around and what those voices should be sounding like. It'd be a lot like a person, I think that had a really strong accent coming in and mink and trying to mingle and, and, mm. and talk to you good point. and you not be able to identify that that's not, for example, a, a English speaking American, for, right? You know, that's an English speaking Russian or, or something you, you, your ear would pick that up. And I think in that same way, uh, especially seasoned elk, the, the, the bulls that have gotten to a mature age, I think they've heard it all right. And they've heard it over and over. And a lot of times in a public land over the counter unit, those bulls virtually don't talk unless it's at night. And, uh, so to answer your question, that was a lot of buildup. I think, I think a few things. I think keying on looking at topographical maps and keying on areas where other people don't want to go. Right. Doesn't mean it's the furthest place back in, but okay. uh, there are places where it is really, really rugged, and you have to want you have to want to be there, and it's going to make you, it's going to test how bad you want to be there. Right. But, but if you can give the other advice I would say is to ha give yourself a little more time if possible, uh, to allow yourself to get in there without hurting yourself or, you know, whether it be, you know, hurting your knees or ankle or, you know, falling or whatever it is, you need to be able to do it in a smart way, in safe way, safe way. And get it's packs, you know, everything we need is going to be in our pack. So mm -hmm. every night we're sleeping at a new location. So mm -hmm. if it took us half a day to get to that most rugged, hardest place to get to, and we fall over that ridge, you know, that's where we're going to be sleeping that night mm -hmm. and try to hunt that area or whatever it is. Yes. And obviously you have to be super, you know, as animals, you have thermal uh, mm -hmm. wind conditions. The thermals are, you know, they're going up during the heat of the day, carrying right. their scent uphill. And then at night it's all settling down. So if your camp, wherever your camp is located, then you're going to have your prevailing winds that are also swirling it around. So wherever your camp is located, uh, you have to keep in mind that again, those animals are survivors. If they're there, they're survivors, right? And they are, their nose is their number one. That is their number one because well before they can see you, they can smell you, right? right? And that's your scent, especially like a camp type scent is going to carry a long ways. I've, I've camped in, uh, valleys in Alaska before moose hunting where we knew there was moose in the area cause we saw them from the air mm -hmm. land. You can't hunt the same, same day, day that you fly. So day. you're there camping, get everything set up and we're, we're quiet and we do everything, uh, kind of according to the rules. But especially when you're on a waterway, that water that influence of that water, that influences the air currents. And, and so now you're, you're doing other things with your scent that that's like another variable and, uh, got into some areas like that and three or four days of spending time in that area, we literally never saw the moose that we knew were there. So again, th that it wasn't that they saw us or heard us. It's that they smelled us. <coughs> <laughs> no problem so so you need to be really mindful of, of your where camp, your camp is located and trying to obviously i don't think there's a whole lot you're going to do to control your scent in the back country you're not showering for mm -hmm. the most part you're sweating because the terrain is you know so every day you're sweating you so you're not going to overcome an animal's nose from a you know a um like a scent control standpoint, mm -hmm. but, uh, so the wind is, is critical. So you want to stay as away from where you're going to hunt as much as possible until you're ready to hunt. And that means glass, right? So keeping your camp away from where you think you're going to see the animals, I guess. that's okay. And, and then using your glass to cover terrain to the extent possible. Right. And obviously right. in some areas that's not possible, but uh, uh, another thing I would say is, is, um, uh, being willing to sit up at night a little bit and, and do some listening. You've told me that a couple of years ago. Yeah. Because public that's land where you can uh, at least hear them. So you know which direction to go in the morning. That's right. And you will, you can, 
it's hard on your on your rest schedule, mm-hmm. but you can kind of get a direction of movement. And and if you you know where you first start hearing them, that's obviously going to be a little closer to their bedding area. And where you last are hearing them later in the morning is they're on their way back there. So uh, listening is. That's a good rule for life too, as yeah. as being a good listener. I think it applies uh, in the public land elk woods, and that is um, uh, at nighttime. That if they're going to be vocal at all, that's when they're going to be vocal, and it will shut off like a light when that sun comes up. So um, that's a good point, I, and I really haven't put that into my. You know, we're going two things. Um, we're going September third. We'll be basically starting our backcountry hunt on september 5th and the moon will actually be a, a new moon mm-hmm. and it'll be dark which is typically during september 20th range for the mm-hmm. past few years so this year is an early season new moon and i don't know if that'll encourage these elk to be a little bit more pre-rutting vocal i don't i don't have a clue in the experience in that but <clears throat> really just hoping that people typically would go hunting in september 20th middle of the month time range time frame <clears throat> and we're going early and the moon's on our favor this year mm-hmm. it the past few years i've gone when it was muzzleloader season and it was a full moon and it just wasn't perfect so i feel like i'm timing it well uh, and i'm happy with the timing and you know just trying to get back in there away from everything and but i am intimidated by public area that we're in the unit that we're in is no calling they're not going to be talking so what is the tactic is once you're in the woods, can I, you know, or am I just trying to sneak up on these things or are you, I mean, are you actually calling once you're close? If you're, you... if you're an, if you're a very seasoned and experienced caller, um, you, 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 you can have some success, um, mm-hmm. calling, but you're usually, you've got to be right up in the red zone. So yeah. my, to answer your question, I think that, yeah, it's a lot of trying to locate the elk without them having one single clue you're there scent sound the calling all of that mm-hmm. you're drawing attention to yourself the second you so call. going so, quiet so so truly like you're hunting an early season mule deer in my opinion and but it's knowing that it could be a solitary bull it could be a bachelor group or it could be a bull who's already kind of starting to gather up his cows so right. so there's all those different variables and a younger bull who's by himself searching is much more callable obviously than a than a herd bull a herd bull is expecting you to come to him because he's already he already has what he wants yes. right so calling those type of bulls requires some very specialized tactics mm-hmm. that seasoned people have but then you can you can look at the masters i'm going to use randy ulmer as an example um very accomplished elk and mule deer hunter incredible archer just incredible guy uh super into specialized tactics and he'll, he will tell you that he never calls a bull he's after very specific large old bulls and he doesn't call he he gets in tight and then he is persistent and he's making sure that he's not putting his scent where those elk are going to pick it up and he's mm-hmm. making sure that he uh, capitalizes on his opportunity when it becomes available and he's making sure that they don't ever have a clue that he was there. And he never made a sound sound. perspective. Yeah. And then, but so he's waiting for them to walk down the trail that they're moving down Mm. or while he's whitetail hunting them. Well, he's, he's more in pursuit. He's kind of, a lot of times you're behind them. And then, and then when it, and then when the opportunity arises, depending on the bull's position, if he's by himself or he's with the cows, where his positioning is. And he's a lot of times, if it's early, he's not, wildly chasing other younger bulls around Mm -hmm. he's more just kind of keeping them together you know so it it, it's not maybe quite as difficult to predict whereas if you start getting towards the rut now you've got three or four ten satellite bulls running around and he's just chasing them all over the place like an antelope well Mm -hmm. you see that in open country um then getting in bow range starts getting very difficult but you also sometimes can have a little bit of potential to call him in that situation right. in if you're zone. in his red zone red zone you got to be in the red zone so get I, I love the tactic of finding them listening to them find, you know getting to don't waste our time but use our ears figure out where they're at don't go that side of the mountain whenever they're on this side because they talk to them each other all night mm-hmm. get in be in pursuit 
play the win, be moving to them, have our packs on. So if we don't get to them in one day, hopefully they're kind of in that area the next morning, and then we make a little bit more of adjustment, try to get in within the red zone. And at that moment, if you are needing to call and it's, you know, irritate him or intimidate him if I have to, but he's probably not going to leave those cows or – if I'm getting busted and act like a cow or sound like a cow potentially mm-hmm. to I get think in close. the closer. cow is safer. You know, anytime you start using any kind of bull call, even in tight like that, you run a big risk of him gathering those cows up and running them out of there. Cause, yes. Cause he, he doesn't, knows. he doesn't want that. He doesn't want the potential of another bull getting in too tight. So a lot of times, a lot of the time, even a big bull will, will take his cows and he'll move them if you use a bull call, even yeah. in the red zone. So it's risky. Um, sometimes it works like a champ. Uh, it just depends on the attitude of that. Yeah, well, he's going to tell you what he's thinking at that yeah. moment, the way he's communicating and That's bugling. Right. That's right. And so. then, but the cow, um, you know, situation, it, it, I, cow calling is the easy. I mean, I'm not a bad caller. I've had years of uh, coyote calling, mm-hmm. you know, mouth calls and reeds and turkey calling. So I, I'm not a but I don't know, understand the personality that that elk is talking to me about or what he's trying to tell me right. or what he's trying to tell the situation. And that comes from experience in the woods and, and around elk. So, so I'm a little nervous about that calling. So I'm going to use your tactic of, you know, staying with them, finding them, listening to them, and then moving in in pursuit the entire time. And then I, I, I'm pretty self-aware of the situation in the woods of what's, what that elk's doing. Is he gathering? Is he, is he protecting? Is he, you know, intimidating another satellite bull. Try. I can. I can probably attempt or hear that and interpret that, and then I'll just make my adjustment. But the only other thing is uh, watering holes. I mean, you know, early season it is going to be a little bit hotter up there. Do you sit on water holes? And have you ever? They can be very, very effective, but they can be super tricky from a wind perspective. Yes. So midday, uh, up the mountain. Well, any time of day, really. You have water holes a lot of times they're just kind of positioned in cuts or or you know bottoms of something uh, obviously yeah. where they're catching so and that's a that's just like a whitetail oh. you can't hunt in a pond for a whitetail you're just that water that, wind's just sitting there swirling that wind is tricky and a smart bull or smart even well almost all of them are going to mm-hmm. approach a water source from downwind so mm-hmm. you have to kind of you have to figure out the terrain and how they're how you think they're going to approach downwind and then position yourself out of that wind cone right so that's that's it's tough to do when you find water in more flat terrain uh that that you're going to tend to have a little more success okay. sitting on that water hole if if you happen to want yeah. to sit on it so um yeah, it does. It does work when the wind situation is is doable. So we're we're running into about forty minutes in, but I wanted you to do two things uh, for us: is kind of give me that that bull that you killed on public land. Just paint that picture to me on uh, how you harvested that bull on public land in Colorado, correct? Mm-hmm. Over the counter, and then and then kind of go next onto that is. Um, I want to. I kind of want to hear what your setup is this year on 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 your bow, and because I I love bows and I love the tinkering side of things, and I just kind of want to hear what you're planning on using this year. So uh, as you know, I film with Cody Robbins and Live mm-hmm. to Hunt, uh, which is on the Outdoor Channel, and and we film all of our hunts. And so our sponsor is Bowtech mm-hmm. Archery, and I shoot a Revolt X. And um, whether I worked with Cody or not. Uh, I've been a Bowtech fan for quite a few years. Uh, that particular bow, the Revolt X, is uh, probably one of my favorite bows I've ever owned. And for a lot of reasons, it's very shootable. Um, is it a taller or shorter bow? Is it The X is a lo- slightly longer. It's not a long bow. Long like 31 or axle. something? Yeah. I, I, honestly, I don't know the exact number. But, but it's, it's not it's, short and compact, and it's no, not like a it's, target bow. It's 31 or two right in mm-hmm. there. Um, they have the Revolt, which is the shorter axle bow. So the Revolt X is the longer one. Okay. Um, and, of course, there's, there's a lot of great bows out there. But um, I personally like that bow. Um, I like the way that it shoots. I like the speed of it. It's quiet, and it's just dead in my hand, and... and And it's just the fit and finish, everything on it is really, it's well made. So um, as far as bows, I 
believe that you need to, you know, it needs to feel good to you, whatever mm-hmm. it is. So you need to shoot the different models or makes or whatever you do. You need to, you need to shoot it and you need to, um, I, I always kind of explain it as if you were to close your eyes and be brand agnostic and, and, and look at, you know, or, or not even brand, but models, you know, a right. lot of people are only going to shoot this brand of bow so they are choosing within the lineup of models so if that's your mindset um then shoot shoot all of them that are in the price range that you can afford and and just ask yourself what if you closed your eyes and shot it what how does it feel to you because the better that it feels to you the draw cycle and the and the valley and how it holds and your back wall everything about it uh if it feels better, you're going to be more confident and you're going to shoot better. Mm -hmm. Um, the reality is that even the lower end bows today are way better than the upper end bows of, of not 10 years ago, probably long ago, eight years ago. So, uh, you, the technology's just come a long way. They're, they're getting a lot more energy out of any given setup and, um, all bow manufacturers build great bows now. And, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, locally here we have knock at archery. They Love carry them, a lot of the brands. They're doing great things in our community. It's so Good cool people. to walk in there and have a, li- I mean, every flagship brand, bro, bow and their flagship models to pick up and try to shoot. I just, I, when I found that out like two years ago when they moved to the new location and I even was seeing them at their old location, mm-hmm. God, we didn't have that. I mean, you said you spent, I mean, we don't have to go into the details, but you spent a lot of time in a bow shop as a kid. That's and it's very impactful for yeah, me. Yeah. So, that is an unbelievable resource for our community. And it is always, there's 30 kids in there. When every time I walk in there, mm-hmm. I mean, there'll be a, a homeschool um, and their, their activity is to come shoot and there'll be 30 kids in there. I talked to Brian and James over there the other day and Brian was telling me, I think the number now is they've got close to 150 kids up as part of their shooting clubs and teams that they're, that they're doing. It's unbelievable. The impacts of that with, with our youth and our community are huge because archery is that it teaches a lot of things self-discipline it teaches and, all those things we talked about from the very beginning exactly and it's like it's it's something that anybody can do if they're willing to put their mind to it and and it's about repetition and it's it's about it's about learning the mechanics of of, of doing it obviously there's mm-hmm. a lot of important mechanics but uh, when you have good people uh, I used knock it as an example. I would use Wayne and Lisa Endicott in Oregon where I go a lot. They're great friends of mine up there. Well, your hats, the bow rack. Yeah. Legend of the sport and of that industry. And they literally grew that business. They've been in business a long time and they built their own shop with their own hands and sacrifice. They lived out of, you know, uh, I think a, like a travel trailer or something during the time that they were building that shop because they had to sacrifice they had they had a goal Mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier and they were disciplined in achieving that goal and when they when he built that shop with his own hands literally framed it and built it himself Wayne did and Lisa and um, what's grown from that is um, that's where Cam Haynes shoots right that's where that's kind of his home base archery shop and his platform has been big and has promoted that but the to me, the the, the coolest uh, thing about about a shop like that or like Knock It is Wayne is amazing with kids, and he has instructed thousands of people. And I, when I am up there and when I've been in his shop, I've literally – I can't get over the number of youth in there, and mm-hmm. I also can't get over uh, – there was one girl that sticks out in my mind that – that told us where I'm standing there talking to Wayne. And she said, I've driven by this place for years and I always have had a curiosity about it. And I've always thought I'd really like to learn how to shoot a bow. And something made me stop today. So he, you were there that day. I was there and I watched Wayne interact with her and how he, I mean, he immediately, he was just so welcoming number one, Mm -hmm. but um, very patient. And, and that girl was shooting amazing within minutes. He had her set up. He knew he just knows how to how to make them feel comfortable. Right. And if you're if you're relaxed and comfortable, you're going to be a better archer than if you're anxious oh, and you know, having issues. So uh, she came in a little intimidated. She left there hooked, and 
what a positive environment and what a mm-hmm. positive role model. And I feel this, I feel that way about Brian Murphy and James down there at knock is they're, they're, they're very courteous. They're very welcoming and they are involving our youth in something that is very positive and it builds people up. Maybe, uh, you know, I know that there's some people that get into archery, uh, at a young age that maybe they maybe they don't want to play football or they don't yeah, want to do yeah. something that's rough or whatever it is, or maybe they're just not very athletically inclined, right? But you don't have to be athletic to shoot a bow. And and I think in that way, it's something that's, number one, it's cool. Who mm-hmm. doesn't like watching an arrow fly, yeah, you know? So. But uh, number two is, is if you can get yourself in an environment with other positive people in a team environment like that, and you're now you can go, if you want to, and join tournaments. There's all kinds of tournaments Love available. It. And get these kids wrapped up in something that teaches a lot of good life values and that's what i love about a a good pro shop a good archery pro shop and they're all over the country i love that i appreciate you going into detail and there's no doubt that's i believe the same thing and i think that's a an unbelievable resource for our community and brian's always trying to um you know be involved he he goes up to you know what is it the um the junior women's club daddy daughter dance mm-hmm. we had it um, and he brought a trailer out there and targets for the for the little girls to just to go out there and shoot how cool is that? i mean dude it was he said that was like one of the best events he's ever seen yeah. ever done because it was just um watching those dads and daughters connect over shooting a bow and arrow at a target mm. it gives me chills but it's awesome um running out of time but you know that that colorado vision get, give me that get paint the picture of what you were able to accomplish in an over-the-counter situation because you hunt a lot of private land now mm-hmm. and with with certain guides and things like that that you're able to have resources to but there was a time where you were like me or like the consume like the the listeners here who don't have the resources or don't have the time or the the network to do do what you do over the counter paint a picture of a hunt that you were successful in yeah and so on the on the 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 filming aspect with live to hunt is is it makes it filming on public land and putting it on television has a lot of restrictions so that's a lot is it really yeah so that's a lot of what's driven me to private land hunting because there are none of those restrictions so so that's logistically one of the things that's made that uh you know uh a shift and and it's not that I still don't hunt public land cause I do, I'll be hunting public land this year, but, uh, probably, uh, probably one of my favorite public land, um, bulls was actually in Oregon. And, uh, and what our tactic was, was in the area that we were hunting, there wasn't, there wasn't as much water as there is in other areas as what we noticed in that area. So, we literally started covering ground, looking at water sources, and some of them weren't very far from the road. And we quickly were able to figure out where the elk were watering. And well, not quickly; it was a bit of a process. Hiking and looking. Hiking and looking is, it, and it's something that uh, what I noticed was in that area we were finding this water on topo maps, and it you couldn't see it. You couldn't see it in your glass, and it, it a lot of it was not very big watering points, and they're kind of buried in the timber. Let's say covered by trees. Yep. And if you can find those kinds of things, those are the spots that other people aren't. They're not targeting them because they don't know they're there. Because a lot of people aren't taking the time to study those maps, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, and you can combine that with Onyx on your phone Absolutely. and you can f- make sure of your boundaries and all that. And Onyx is a very valuable. We use it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so finding water point, elk are going to water every day. And, but sometimes they're watering at night. So you could sit on that water hole forever, but you need to know if elk are in the area, right? And water is a surefire way to know they're going to visit some water at some point if you have a lot of streams and stuff like that that starts making it really difficult but in this case uh, there weren't there was just small little bits of water here and there so ironically um, we were checking a water hole we had just found tracks a lot of fresh tracks so there was a herd in there we could tell and we were hiking up out of it and here's a a bull way up at the top of the hill that we just happened to see it was 
complete luck, right? He was in an opening of some sort. He was in a small opening and he just moved through it. We only had a few seconds to, to see that it was him Mm -hmm. or that it was an elk, you know, and we couldn't tell if there was one elk or if it was 50 elk, we didn't know, but it was a good hike up there. And, uh, and of course we were all in, you know, so Mm -hmm. we blasted up that hill. This was early season too. So they're not vocal. Um, you but didn't sit there instantly call that guy. No, you, you no, pursued no. it. Pursued no, him. our goal was move up the hill in increments, glass, move, glass, not waste a lot of time glassing because it kind of looked like he was on the move. So we didn't want to be behind him, just be out oh, yeah. of the country. You'll know, never so, catch him. So we're moving, we're, we're, we are busting our tails to get up the hill as quick and quick and quiet as we could. Um, uh, and got up, I think we stopped about three times for maybe two or three minutes, glassing, looking real carefully, move, glass, look real carefully. And when we got up there, probably about a mile up there, uh, we thought now we're about where he was. But we also looked at the direction he la- When we saw him moving, we, we kind of tried to get in front of him a little right. bit. And... It was one of those things where everything just aligned amazing because we got in there and my buddy that was with me is a very good out caller. I consider myself a good out caller, but this guy is like next level. I mean, he sounds like an elk. Um, and he, he just gave a couple of very soft cow calls and within, I'd say within a minute or two there was no noise the bull didn't respond we didn't hear yeah, any he twigs didn't break. To it. it was so quiet he was as quiet as a mouse and in fact we didn't even see him coming in but there was a little bit of timber in the way and all of a sudden he was just there and it was and he was like 50 yards from us and he's staring right at us but <laughs> we're we're there's little berms and benches and we're, we're kind of just, mm-hmm. he's probably looking at about the top half of our heads, you know, and we were sitting still. So he kind of knew from our call, I think where we were, but now he's like expecting to see, to see an elk. Yeah. And if, and that's a big thing. Yeah. That's a big You're thing. Setup. If you set up and you start calling from an area where an elk, when an elk comes into an area and if, if where you're calling, he, he can get within 200 yards of that and thinks he should be able to see something and he doesn't, he's going to hang up right there. I I hear you. Just like Turkey. Yep. So you want to hide your location and that's why we had that little berm in front of us. So, um, it was perfect because we, we stayed very quiet, didn't move. And after about five minutes of him just staring and watching and listening, he, he was like, well, I guess I'm going to go look, you know? And so yeah. he started skirting us and he was going to, he was going to get our wind. That's what he was going for. He didn't see, he didn't visually see it. And then he needed to validate it with his nose next. That's right. And, um, because he, you know, they're just smart and he mm-hmm. was an old, he was a big, big bull. And he, he ended up as he was circling us, I could see an opening coming up that he was going to walk. It really wasn't a very great opening, but it was going to be about a 40 yard shot. And, uh, and I ended up, I ended up killing that bull, and um, it was we we waited about an hour. That's kind of my standard. And when we walked up on him, there was already a bear on him. And uh, no it, way. It, yeah, so it was an exciting. It was an it was right at dark. It was already getting dark, in right. fact. And we we were following the flashlight with blood trail, and all of a sudden, I can see the bull, and uh, and then. As black I shine the eyes. flashlight, here comes some eyes, and we're ten yards from this bull with a with a black bear on him, and it, it was it was amazing. It was a it was a really cool experience. But uh, in my experience, public land elk hunting, um, we have mostly that one. We were within a mile of a, of a roadway. Uh, more of my success has come probably a little further back than that. I would say that two miles is probably a good mark to kind of from there on. Uh, but more importantly, I think the terrain, I think, um, because I can think back to, especially when I hunted Colorado a lot, a lot of it was some of the steeper areas that had bowls at the top of them that had a lot of feed in them. Um, and they were just, that was a tough climb and people weren't willing to do that day after day. Yep. And, uh, 
so the the it goes back to being in shape if you want to be successful a lot of people say well you don't have to you know do a cam haynes 240 mile marathon to to be to kill an elk or a deer or whatever well maybe that's true if you have luck and you have like a ridiculously good area and everything falls into place but guess what i bet you that people that are driven and in shape are going to be successful way more Mm -hmm. of the time and if you look at cam as an example his percentage of success speaks for itself so uh to me it's a motivator that's that's what that's a big big part of my fitness motivation is is training hard so that i can hunt easier right right no that's a good point i like that because going through you know all of the you know, pain and dedication and waking up early or whatever it may be, it will pay off whenever you're got to that elk or mm-hmm. you get to that animal. And then you've practiced under those situations. Mm-hmm. And when you go to settle in, you know, with your bow, hopefully your stamina is staying there. And so you can at least hold tight for a minute or 45 seconds to let an arrow go. It makes such a huge difference. I do two cardios per day and one lift per day. So And I have noticed that uh, the place I hunt in Montana for mule deer almost every year, um, it's, it's, there's some really steep areas there that we hike into that to just to get to our glassing points. And I'm up there and glassing recovered almost immediately now. And, and I'm enjoying those hunts way more than I did during that window I explained earlier. And, and, you know, if we blow a stock, I've still got it in me to do that day after day. Some people get so sore that they'll do that one time and then, and then they're out, yeah. you know, they've just checked out and that'll, that will not be me. So. No, I hear you. Well, it's um, amazing how much hunting has proven to uh, make you a more dedicated and, and, and diligent person in everything you do. So obviously your, your career is in the insurance side of things here indicator but you represent a lot of corporate companies and, um, and all over the, the uh, country, I guess, or is it all statewide? Yeah, we do. So we do a lot of employee benefits right. and we do uh, a lot of commercial as well. And mm-hmm. some of these companies, yeah, they're branched all over the country. And even we have some that branch into international areas that, that we handle. So there's wow. really no level of complexity. We've got groups from two employees all the way up to 2000. So man, multi-state. And have you ever found where you go to meet with a client and you all have something in common like hunting? Is it run, you run into that more and more lately? We have. And I think, you know, having been on uh, TV with the, for some of these guys that are passionate, um, it, it definitely has been a, uh, something that when that is something that we share, it, it makes it real easy to talk about, you know, and, and, uh, and they trust you, you anyways. It's like that brotherhood that we talked about. From yeah, the very beginning. yeah. But, but I want them to be able to trust me regardless. Oh, it's yeah. my whole, my whole life is, is built around, around, you know, um, trying to develop and reward good character with other people. And so I, you know, I, I see that as kind of a personal responsibility and it's just who I am and who I want to be. So, yep. I think uh, that 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 is. I love that I can work with people that I truly enjoy being around and that I have things in common with. And if I can do that, um, if God will continue to bless me in that arena, that um, that I just can't think of a better work life than that. You know, is to be able to be. Uh, around people that enjoy that because universally um, it, it just makes it so easy to talk about a lot of things outside of insurance because yeah. a lot of people get pretty bored with that but um, but yeah I love it I think um, we also need to give a shout out to your wife because she's allowed you to pursue a career a, a hunting career a passion and you've involved her in a lot of this and you've she's sacrificed raising you know not raising but staying back while you're gone for a week, getting the girls to work or getting girls to school, volleyball to whatever it may be, cheerleading. Um, You can see what Tracy does. My wife is a rock star and she's, and she's, she's in a lot of ways. um, She's the most selfless person that I've ever known. And that's fact. She's 
the best mother that I've ever known. That that is a fact. And she uh, she stuffs away any of her goals or or passions that she might want to, you know, maybe would want to pursue if she didn't have children. But her children, my kids passions or even not even passions just things that they want to do or try she'll she'll just put herself immediately second she'll stuff that stuff away because our kids are her passion Mm -hmm. you know and she's she's a real inspiration to me she uh as you know she had uh colon cancer uh got diagnosed in december of 19 Mm -hmm. and uh, we went through the surgery and the chemo and all of that in 2020 and she also showed me I always considered myself the strong one in the right. relationship you know and she she taught me uh during that time that I was I was I had a real weakness and and I also realized how much I loved her you know mm-hmm. and, and that right there it's 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 like a it's it's a it's a it's it's almost, it's more than a chapter. It's something that's like a demarcation in my, in my whole life of, of really learning a point or something that I don't know if it was God talking to me or what it was, but I learned a lot uh, about life and about her and her strength during that time. And it, and it's something I'll never forget because she, her, here's how selfless she is. Her very first thing she said to me is I do not want my kids to be scared during Mm -hmm. this and she was talking to me pointing a finger at me like so how are you going to handle she knows i'm (laughs) i'm i can be emotional on those subjects you know so uh i'm strong on a lot of things but when it comes to my family and their health and well-being i am i am a baby Mm -hmm. and um and she she (laughs) carried me through that with her own burden and she was so strong and such a warrior um it, it, it was just super inspirational. So. Well, I thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. Cause this is, you know, something that I actually enjoy it. it yes. We've had these uh, types of conversations for the past 10 years, but it's, it's, it's something that I wanted to do. So people can kind of get to know you a little bit. Cause I really think that you're a very special character in, in, in our community that a lot of people don't know what the heck you do behind the scenes. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, obviously you like, if you don't follow Brian on his Facebook or whatever, you'll see all amazing stories and man, all the videos that you've ever made, um, they're all on YouTube, but you know, what, what videos and what platform should they go to, to find any other old hunting videos that you've done? Um, YouTube has, um, just two quick ones that come to mind. Both, uh, both were pretty epic, uh, adventure one was called i will i loved and, that and, one and that one is about my stone sheep and goat hunt and um and uh was dedicated to callan little mm-hmm. and the other one is one called i will uh it's called choose to sing and uh that that is about my late friend rick carone one of my best friends in my life who passed away of pancreatic cancer and just was an extremely inspirational person not only to me but uh, lots of people around. He used to do this Oregon trip. I'm about to go on. That was, uh, Mm -hmm. I took him up there and, and, uh, he also hunted Eastern Colorado with me several times. A lot of that's highlighted on that film, but the film is about mule deer hunting, bow hunting, open country mule deer, but it's also about Rick's way of how he fought his terminal illness. And, uh, I would highly encourage you to look that one up. Michael, can you, uh, please put that on the link and make sure you Find them on you. Are they whose channel are they on? Uh, that that one, I I believe both of those are on the Live to Hunt channel. But if okay. they're not, if you search, I will uh, and then Live Number Two Hunt, all one word. I will live together. To hunt. Yeah, if you search that, you'll see it. That one, and if you search the other one, the same way. It's Choose to Sing, and then if you type in Live to Hunt right after, you'll 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 come across those, and it's a bow hunting open country mule deer. Those are probably two of my favorite films. Mm-hmm. Those were both independent films that Live to Hunt helped me. Uh, Cody uh, and then uh, Richie Caseman over there at Live to Hunt. Um, wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, they helped me produce those. And then uh, and then a lot of the show episodes that I've been on uh, with Live to Hunt are, are on there as well, uh, on the Live to Hunt channel right. on YouTube. So, and you'll have a camera with you every hunt this year? Yes. Cameraman, never solo filming? Uh, I also solo film some. Okay. And, uh, but not so much on the Western hunting, though, right? 
Western is way tougher to do. Oh, that. Yeah. It's it's I don't want to call it impossible, but if you're going to have a really good quality film, it's <laughs> way mm-hmm. tougher. Yeah. I will tell you, there's a good friend of mine, Wayne Endicott's son, Nathan. He has started doing some self filming Western stuff that I'm. You told me about that. I'm really surprised at how good of a job he's doing and each one of them gets a little better he's actually dropping a new film today i believe at 3 p.m pacific it's either today or tomorrow and it's going to be about a nevada uh public land uh archery tag that he drew yeah and uh his teaser is up already and i'm i'm really fired up about it sweet his music choice was very uh it reminds me of like cody robbins Mm -hmm. lived hunt type music which i think marries to the outdoor experience really well. So That's great. I'm excited. Um, Michael, I don't even know if I've even started sharing my whitetail hunt from last year. If you don't mind finding that one on my YouTube channel and put that up there too. So people can kind of see a little bit about my whitetail videos <clears throat> for all of Brian's amazing films. They're not just videos like mine. His are straight up films that should be on a, you know, you should pay to watch in my opinion. But, um, <laughs> Long story short, man, this is a great. This is exactly what I wanted. This is a story that I wanted to, you to tell, um, and I wanted our listeners to kind of get a good feel for you. And I know you've been on a few podcasts, but this is this is the type of conversations that Brian and I have on a regular basis. Yeah. He is a mentor of mine, and I don't know if I've ever really feel like I've told you that, but I've told other people that that uh, I look up to you, and you've given me more direction in my family, my pursuit of the Lord, and uh, my career, and then. The hunting was obviously the last thing I'm going to name because it's that's just a perk of doing all the things right that I listed first, that we have the opportunity to go hunting as much as we, you know, can or are willing to. So it's, um, you are, you are the man and, um, you know, our friendship means a lot to me. Well, that's, I feel exactly the same and I'm thankful to, um, thankful for your friendship as well. And you, you're an inspiration to me in a lot of ways as well. And, and, uh, and especially in how you how you carry yourself in the community, your your the way that you interact and highlight your family, um, and we've had a lot of conversations about uh, the influence of God in our lives and prioritizing that and making that the foundation mm-hmm. and where it should be. And and I uh, appreciate you saying those things because that's those are all in line with uh, you know that I'm a very goal oriented person and yes. I have my long term end of life. You know when I look down the road, whenever that day is. Um, if I can, if I have helped people find God in their life by any means, whatever that is, if it's, if it's secondarily, like I've just inspired them through, uh, from a distance, or if it's directly, which I try to make that my main way, mm-hmm. um, then I will have considered my life successful. That's what I've ingrained in my children. My wife has done the same thing and together we're, uh, we have made that a priority and I really, I can't understate how important that is, but as, as a goal set, uh, your words are, are very, uh, you know, they just bless me. So I'm good. I appreciate that. Heck yeah. Well, Michael, I'll let you sign us out and we'll uh, head on down the road. You got to go to Oregon tomorrow and, um, get packed up and I appreciate you taking the time because I know you have a lot to do with your career and packing. So, and I understand the packing. I can't, I'm out, I'm flying to Colorado and I'm like, it's blowing my mind how I'm going to get this done um, with everything I want to take. Um, but anyways, Michael, thank you for uh, setting this up. Michael today is setting it up right when we showed up the branded film and media podcast studio is ready to go. So if there's a service out there that you're looking for to do podcast, you walk in the door, you sit down, Michael has it ready to go. He can produce it, edit, and um, post it for you, and or even bank them, and we can post them later. So, Michael, hit the music, and uh, I'll go ahead and sign us out. So, thank you guys so much for joining us on the Careway Team Podcast. We had Brian Stevens with Stephen Bastion and Cartwright Insurance, and he is uh, the family man, the hunter in town. And uh, when you see him, shake his hand, tell him you listen to the podcast, see me, tell you listen to it. It encourages us, and, and we want to keep doing these. So the support and the love in town is what we wanted to hear. That's right. Thank, Thank you, you guys. For having me.